A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia, and we are recording this on July 21st, 2021. Joining us today is Dr. Nikki Ali Jackson, a professor of criminal justice at Purdue University Northwest. Dr. Jackson is also an expert in domestic violence issues and wrongful convictions. Welcome back, Dr. Jackson. It's great to have you. Thank you for having me. Oh, we really want to hear your input on our cases today because one, a very big component of the crime involves allegations of domestic violence and the issues of what happens when courts don't grant protective orders. So I'll be very curious to hear your analysis of that case. We've got two cases this week. One, a man in Wisconsin has been charged with murder after his father's dismembered remains have been found, but his mother is still missing. But first, a Baltimore police officer is accused of murdering his 15-year-old stepson. The teen's body was found in an attic crawl space. There are accusations of domestic violence, which are a big part of this investigation right now. So this all happened on July 6th. Police responded to a child custody dispute in the Curtis Bay area of Baltimore, Maryland. And Dr. Jackson, as we're going to get into the details here, usually some of the most volatile moments within an argument involving either child custody and domestic violence are those moments when a big change is happening in the family dynamics. Is that not correct? That is correct, P- particularly when a victim attempts to leave a relationship. Um, that's when they are the most vulnerable to uh, actually being killed. So um, it appears in this case that when the mother, you know, it said we're done, um, clearly, you know, something happened here in the sun and the Dr. Jackson, let's let's get to the details of what was going on that day, the hours leading up to it. And of course, then we'll do the history of the family. So according to The Independent, the cop's wife is the one who called the police. She said that she was standing outside waiting for her 15 year old son to come out of the house. So clearly something was going on that she felt she needed to call the authorities to come in because she didn't see her son and it appears that she was worried for some time because she hadn't heard from him. So the stepfather is identified as 34 year old Eric Banks Jr. He's also a Baltimore police officer. Now he initially claimed to the responding officers to his home that his 15 year old stepson, Desan Jones had left the home without his belongings. So you've got the stepfather telling police, no, 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 he left already. You have the mother saying, no, 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 I know my son, he's, he has not come out of this house. So clearly there are some serious concerns as to where, where the child is, the teen, the young adult. According to the Baltimore son, Eric Banks allowed the officers to do kind of like a preliminary search. And and these are always the tricky issues is when is the search warrant engaged? When is there a quick search? If there is a sense that the police believe there's any danger. So he allowed the officers in for a cursory search. And that is when they started to see some things that pointed to the possibility of, of violence in the house. There were, there were indicators here. So And then, of course, they obtained the search warrants to do a much more thorough search where they could collect the evidence. CBS Baltimore reports that police say a white sheet was found using to hide a hole in the wall, which is kind of a bizarre thing. And according to a police spokesperson, the officers checked the residence and discovered that the teen was unresponsive and they found him in an upstairs attic crawl space. So police also noted that there were injuries on Dasan's neck, face, and mouth. The Baltimore Sun says that Dasan died from asphyxiation. So this is very disturbing at this point. Very disturbing. So what's interesting about this case, um, and obviously what I know about this case is just reading in the media like everyone else, uh, because it's such a new case. 
Um, but one of the things that I found very interesting, um, and I know it's all over social media, people are asking, you know, why didn't the mother leave? Um, you know, what happened? The, the restraining order failed. There's so many questions that are obviously unanswered at this point. Um, but one of the most important things that I would like for, for viewers um, to, to recognize with restraining orders is that the judge, because people are pretty upset with the judge right now for not granting that original restraining order, but the judge had his or her hands tied because the victim didn't show up to court. And we're not sure, we don't know, because that happened in June. We don't know why she wasn't there, but when she went back, I mean, obviously, this is all speculation at this point. Um, but when she went back, I'm guessing that this man, her husband, knew she was going back and, you know, something happened and he was outraged and um, allegedly, you know, took matters into his own hand and targeted the person that she loves the most. And that was her son. Um, and, uh, you know, when the police did arrive and he knows the law, he's a police officer. Um, when police arrived, he could have absolutely said, no, I'm not going to consent, but he let them in. Um, my gut feeling is he didn't think they were going to go check, you know, the, the attic area. They were probably going to just do a cursory walkthrough and say, oh, you know, everything looks fine and leave. But it, they didn't. And so thankfully, they did not do that. So uh, apparently what happened is that the stepmother, excuse me, the mother and the estranged wife of the police officer here charged with the murder tried to get a restraining order in June. She was denied. And then hours before this incident where the police arrived at the officer's home, she had gone back and applied again for a restraining order. And you're right. People are very angry that the first initial restraining order was not granted. Your, your insight into the fact that she didn't show up and how, you know, that's what happens with, with courts. If you don't show up, whether it is a, you know, whether it's criminal or civil, it, it, there's no one to argue your case for you. Many arguments could be made, of course, that who knows what was going on in her world and her life where it may not even have been safe for her to go. We don't, we don't know that. So, and we find that a lot. I, I think you notice that with issues of domestic violence and, and you know better than anyone it, how things escalate. And it's the constant escalation where someone gets hurt. What's yeah. What is, I mean, it's very tragic here. I well, mean, we, we know, have... and, that's, and, and actually in this case, we don't even know if she was a battered woman. We do know that she applied for a restraining order for some reason. And my, my guess is that she had been abused and she wanted out of this relationship and she didn't feel safe. Um, so, you know, we understand, Anna, you asked a really, um, or you made a very good comment in terms of, you know, how, violence escalates. We know there's a cycle of violence. We know that, you know, there's factors that lead to the explosive phase when the person, you know, there's little things that happen. Somebody gets, um, you know, in trouble at work or they, uh, they, they, they get bad grades or whatever it is. There's these, it's called the tension building phase. So there's tension that's building within this individual. And then there's this explosive stage that occurs and that's when the acute battering occurs. And then we go to that honeymoon or the calm phase where it's, I'm gonna bring you flowers and I promise I won't do this again. And then the tension didn't go away. There's still tension. Um, and so that tension is back. And what we do know about the cycle of violence is that every time there's you know a, a situation, the cycle goes quicker and quicker and quicker. So when she went back in July, she knew that she was in imminent danger and she was in fear um, and she was clearly in fear for her, her, her family. But, you know, the question is, I think, why was she in a hotel room and her son was in the house? But from my understanding of this case, she went to the hotel room and she had contacted her son that she was going to pick him up and bring him back to the hotel room. I think that there's been a lot of confusion about that, at least from what I'm reading in social media. Like, why was the son left behind? I think she went to the court, she went and got the hotel room, she secured that, she was going back to get her son, 
And unfortunately, we, we do know that, um, you know, tragedy occurred during this time period. Yeah, there are some reports that the reason she was suspicious and very concerned about the welfare of her son is because she was receiving these messages that didn't appear to sound like her son. Therefore, she had reasonable fears that the stepfather, her estranged husband, had taken control of her son's phone and therefore he was not, she was not really in communication with her son. And additionally, uh, apparently he had, the son, had reached out to a friend, told the friend that he was concerned for his own safety and that his dad was trying to take his phone away. Mm -hmm. So all those other pieces helped to tell the full story of what was going on in that case. And you, you mentioned what her concerns were based on the records that we've been able to access. The, the mother, Dasan's mother, said that she feared for her life and that of her sons. Um, quoting now, I am in fear for my life and well-being because Eric Banks keeps trying to control, follow, and emotionally abuse myself and my sons. That's according to the Baltimore Sun. Yes. So, and that's when, um, and as part of the court record, that's when she explains that she was staying in a motel room and she was receiving these messages from her son's phone. And that's when she, you know, she started to realize, okay, something's really, something much more serious is going on here. And her own niece told her that her son messaged the, her niece through Instagram, trying to get around the father to kind of get like a, a, a message out. But then they, they realize that the father had taken Dasan's phone. So it, it just, as you can see, well, you can just imagine how terrified this young man must have been in that house I, trying I to get these imagine. messages out. I can't imagine. But what, what, you know, really caught my attention, and as when you mentioned um, in that report that the the wife reported that he was emotionally abusive and like control. And one of the things we do know, I mean, this is not speculation. We do know he was in the Marines for eleven years. We do know that he was a police officer at this department for three years. Um, and we know that control is a really um, an, an important factor, a contributing factor to domestic violence. And we do know that domestic violence um, is prevalent in police families. Um, and I think it's, a, you know, pe people are like, wait, it's a police officer. There's not a lot of studies out there about domestic violence within police uh, families. But what we do know from the research that does exist is that there's a guesstimate of about 40% of police families um, experience domestic violence. And I would argue that that's extremely underreported. Um, you know, police, wives, uh, husbands, whomever, victims, they're not going to call the police on their police offender, right? It's just not going to happen. Um, I, I have worked with people, I, I've seen it with you know, wives of police officers are like, who do we call? Who do we call? We're, we're, who are we supposed to call? Right. Um, and I've even seen it at the, the shelter. You know, I've sat on boards of two domestic violence shelters. We've had police spouses come in um, for their own protection. But then there's still a problem because police officers know where those shelters are. Um, so, you know, I'd love to see more training, um, you know, within the police, um, to each police department on domestic violence issues. But we do know that control is a big factor among police officers. You know, they have to control a situation. They, they, they need to be in control in situations. So when they, you know, when they're home with their families, that trait extends into the family situation. It goes from the work life to the family situation. And I think also there are some true documented cases, and then there's just this general feeling that when you are going into a court and you're asking either for a restraining order or there is an issue, it could be child abuse, it could be numerous things in which you would be in perhaps even a family court, that 
either the, the, the spouse or the children of a police officer often feel that the court tends to lean, if there's any issue of discretion or who's telling the truth, that there's this feeling that the, the alleged victim is completely outnumbered in a courtroom that the, the, and we've seen that in some, in some cases where it's just horrific, like under other circumstances, allegations made against an individual, the court ruling would have ended up quite differently had there not been a police officer as one of, one of the, um, complainants or, or plaintiffs or, or the person who the allegations are made against. So let's get back to some of the evidence in this case, because obviously he is charged and he's charged with the murder of his stepson, but is innocent until proven guilty. So here's more on what the search turned up from the Anne Arundel County police spokesperson, Justin Mulcaney. As multiple items of evidence were collected, apparent bloody clothing was located, which had been concealed in a dresser drawer. So Dr. Jackson, clearly there were some indicators that something was wrong. The smell of bleach, these wet clothes, what appeared to be possibly bloody clothes in the dresser. And then of course you have the body of the 15 year old in the attic. None of this, you know, it looks like he was trying to cover up. What's also interesting here is how banks started acting. It's very, it's very weird. S several news organizations recount the same thing based on what police said that Eric Banks repeatedly asked the officers who were about to take him in to please allow him to kiss his children. They let him. And then as they are still trying to arrest him or, or get him in the car, he loses it. He becomes aggressive and he actually tries to take one of the guns from one of the arresting officers. So there's a scuffle. He does not get the gun. They take him into custody. And then apparently in this, between that scuffle and then the ride back to the police station, according to the arresting officers and the arrest report, Eric Banks starts shouting, my life is over. Choke me, choke me, choke me. Um, he went on saying, you're going to have to end this. Um, so it's almost as if, I think, what is the term they call it? Um, suicide by cop, where, where you're trying to uh, force the officer to kill you? Yeah, that's what this is. I think what, you know, when I watched the press conference, and I have to tell you, I believe when, you know, he was saying, choke me, choke me, and, you know, really just combative with the arresting officers, it just shows his, you know, his fear of losing power and control. He's lost it all at this point, um, and he knows that. Now he's caught, and he's going to fight this. And, um, I, you know, there, there's a possibility that he wanted to be killed by a police officer. There's, you know, the other thing is he could just be at the end of the day, just a coward, doesn't want to go to prison and, and own up for what he's allegedly, you know, committed. Um, so, you know, who knows what what was going on in his mind, but it was a really, uh, um, it sounds like it was a really crazy scene, you know, when they were trying to arrest, you know, one of their own brothers, one of yeah. their own brothers. So police arrested Banks for first and second degree assault, reckless endangerment, disarming a law officer, resisting and interfering with arrest, and failing to abide by a lawful order. Then following the medical examiner's ruling on Dasan's manner of death, the medical examiner ruled it was without question a homicide, and then he was charged with first and second degree murder plus first degree child abuse charges. So they're throwing the book at him here at this point. Now, what's interesting here is the Baltimore Sun reports that the assistant state's attorney, Jason Miller, said at the bail review hearing that Eric Banks admitted to officers that he had moved his son's body from one location in the home to another. So, you know, that, that's a little interesting right there. And that at the entire time he was making not only suicidal, but homicidal comments. So obviously the no, the, the officers arresting him were taking note of that. Now, looking at the other side of this, Eric Banks defense attorney says that the 
stepdad, the arrested officer here, claims that he found Dasan dead in the bathtub, and he believed that the teenager had killed himself. The problem with that is, why in the world, if this is true, did you not call 911 as a first responder, a police officer, and two, why would you move him to the attic? And conceal him. I mean, I, I don't even understand that defense. I have to say, as I was reading through this, I was like, okay, he, they're claiming that that this young man, I believe he goes by DJ, he he killed, he committed suicide in the bathtub. I, it, the whole thing just doesn't jive. All right. I mean, you know, you put together a puzzle. These pieces are not fitting. They don't make sense. Why would you hide his body? Why would you conceal it? in the attic and you know not it just makes no sense and as you've already noted he is a first responder he would have been, should have been the first person to call police and say oh my gosh i just found my stepson and yada 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 but that's not at all what happened um and i'm not sure why the defense is using this defense it, it maybe they know something we don't but it makes no sense logically sometimes common sense you know really is all you need it, other times there might be some kind of, you know, some other piece that we're, we're just missing, but the story doesn't add up. The story doesn't add up. You no, it doesn't. And his attorney, Warren Brown, said, quote, I understand circum circumstantially it looks bad, but I'm looking to understand how he was asphyxiated. I don't think he has to look too far to figure this part out. Yeah, I mean, again, it's all speculation, but, you know, they said that there were marks on his neck, his face, and it appeared that there was a struggle, um, you know, I, and I can't imagine if we just even look at if it was a suicide, kids don't strangle themselves. They don't, you know, do that. Kids, you know, have different ways, especially boys, of, of killing themselves, but not in a bathtub. And it just doesn't make sense. I mean, it just logically does not make sense. No, it, I think it doesn't. This, you know, the evidence is there. Obviously, everybody is innocent until proven guilty, and he deserves a fair trial like any other citizen. But I think the evidence right now, from what we know, what we know is not in his favor. It is not. And they, they indicted him pretty quickly. I mean, mm -hmm. this wasn't, you know, um, or maybe I don't even know, did the indictment come through? I know they arrested him quickly. They arrested him and they then they added charges. Yeah, the state's so, attorney added charges and there could still be another, there could be an indictment on top of that. You know, it, yeah, it really depends I, I on how the prosecutor wants to handle it. I'd like, I wish we knew more about the history of the relationship between the stepson and Eric Banks. But what I believe, um, just from what I've read, was Eric Banks got angry, was ticked off that the wife left and then took it out on the person that she loves the most, her son. Um, and I think we've seen cases like this, you know, uh, I'm going to hurt you. I am going to hurt you. And this is what's going to hurt you. Now, again, this is speculation. He has not been convicted of any crime, but this is how it appears right now. So Eric served as a Baltimore police officer for about three years, and he was suspended at the time of the discovery of his stepson's body. The Baltimore police commissioner, Michael Harrison, said in a statement, quote, the alleged actions of Officer Banks are not only deplorable, but shocking to the conscience. Our department will continue to work closely with the Anne Arundel County Police Department during this ongoing investigation. Banks is currently in protective custody as a potential suicide risk. And of course, he's been suspended from his police duties without pay. A GoFundMe page has been set up to help with the funeral arrangements. And this young man who had his entire life ahead of him is described as just a really lovely young man who loved to play the violin, loved, you know, play, you know, was a gamer, loved gaming. Uh, and he was enrolled in a nursing magnet program. And he hoped to attend college and become a surgeon. It's also senseless, so senseless. And that's the tragedy of it all. That is such a senseless thing. I, I'm curious to, to, to hear more about what unfolds with the evidence and, um, you know, learning more about what his relationship was with the stepson. Um, 
and you know between DJ and uh, Eric Banks. I really am curious to hear more about that. And I wasn't sure if anybody else was in the household during the time that this, you know, um, when DJ died. Was there anybody else there? I think there's a lot of uh, missing information, and I think we we need more. And I think once we get more, um, then you know, then it's time to really look at why this happened and how we can really prevent things like this from happening again. Yeah, there are references where he he insisted he wanted to kiss his other children goodbye. Oh, right. Right. But what's interesting here is that there are big pieces of information that have not been released publicly about the details of the number of children whose children. I mean, there's a lot here. And also, um, I, I find this actually um, something positive is that they have not released his estranged wife's name in all of this, that um, she is not mentioned as, as a victim here. And um, so I, I feel that they're being a little bit more sensitive than generally that we've seen. I in the agree. Past. I think so. And I think because she, she is a domestic violence, you know, victim, um, they're trying to um, really, you know, keep her, her identity private. Um, she's dealing with a lot. Uh, it's unimaginable. And she's going to, you know, be dealing with a lot of guilt um, and other, you know, like she, she's going to feel like I should have done something. I could have prevented this. You know, there's going to be a lot of what ifs for her. Uh, but I really am, um, I have to say, very proud of how this police department is handling this uh, this investigation so far, at least from what it looks like, um, you know, they're 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 definitely, you know, crossing every T and dotting every I, and I think that's really important. And um, but I really really want to know more about the suicide defense. I, I just can't I, I can't understand that defense. I just can't. You're not alone there. Yeah, You're not like, alone there. I'm really baffled by it. I, I and so I'm wondering is there something else that I just don't know about. Well, there's a lot more that we're going to learn right. as this case proceeds. Now, before we move on to our next case, here is a quick word from our sponsor. There's a lot of pride that comes with owning a home and a lot of responsibility. Maintenance, repairs, updates, sometimes it can be a lot to take care of. Introducing Angie, previously known as Angie's List. Angie is your home for everything home. Taking all the work your home needs and putting the solution right at your fingertips. With Angie, you can see upfront pricing on hundreds of projects, instantly book and pay, and connect with expert pros all in one place. Make your home an Angie home. Check out Angie.com today. Our second case is from Wisconsin, where a man who reported his parents missing has been charged with homicide after human remains were found in the investigation. Now, the remains have been identified as this young man's father, but his mother is still missing, and obviously there are concerns for her safety. So let's look at this case. On July 7th, 2021, 23-year-old Chandler Halderson reported his parents missing. He called it in at 11.30 a.m. Chandler told investigators that his parents, Bart and Krista, and he lives with his parents, left their Windsor home on the morning of Friday, July 2nd, to go spend the holiday weekend, the July 4th weekend, at their White Lake cabin. Okay? So he, this is the weird part. I, You know, things start to unravel sometimes from the very beginning. And I th this one started to unravel when he called the cops himself. When the person who ends up being the suspect calls the authorities because they think they're so much smarter than everyone else. So he told the police that they left with a couple, but he didn't know who they were, that they just came and they, they picked him up. It's like, well, that's kind of weird. You generally know who your parents are going with, right? And where they're going, but okay. Um, they, they checked, they asked officers in the other County to go, please check the cabin but there were no signs of the couple having been at the cabin. So now, now they're really worried. Did they not get to the cabin? Did something happen? So Chandler claims that his mother on July 4th sent him a text message saying that they arrived safely. So how is that possible? Because he has a text message, he says, from his mother. You can all see that this is just starting to unravel very, very, very badly. 
According to the criminal complaint, police interviewed Chandler at the family's home. And that evening, the detective noticed, as he's talking to him, some weird things. Pieces of the floor are missing. Pieces of the wall are missing. None of this is a good indication. So, um... Chandler continues to tell the police, well, I, I've tried to call them and the, you know, the calls are going to voicemail. So he's the concerned son, but at the same time, suspicion is starting to increase. So the following day, detectives find human remains on a rural property in Cottage Grove, which is about 15 miles away from the family home. So this, this will come, we're going to explain why that's going to make more sense in just a few minutes. Because see, the son ends up leaving police there. As you can see, like he's trying to tell a story, but at the same time, he's implicating himself. Apparently, apparently the son had been seen by other neighbors and witnesses in this area that he had been driving a car in reverse with the hatch up in an open area near a wooded area. Does that make sense? So it's like where the open part is heading toward a wooded area. So who drives a car in reverse with the hatch up? It's the kind of thing that people notice and remember when all of a sudden someone's missing and you're like, hey, wait a minute, do you remember that guy or do you remember that car? So yeah, Chandler, Chandler's like been leaving breadcrumbs everywhere here. Do you see where this is going, Dr. Jackson? Yeah, it's... uh. <laughs> I think when they went to the property, the uh, his it was his girlfriend's mom's property, from my understanding, and um, they said he left for an hour. And I mean, the things that they were were describing to the police, you know, were very suspicious. Like you know, he left for an hour, he comes back, he he's sh- he's like cleaning himself off. Yeah, there are big red flags there. Um, yeah. That, you know, the, the girlfriend and the mother, I think, are going to be really big uh, witnesses in this case because they were the ones who were probably there when this allegedly happened, you know, mm-hmm. or at least the disposing of, um, of the body. And it's also possible that they may not have known what he was doing. That That's entirely possible, too, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I don't think that the police are even suggesting that they knew because they've been very forthcoming, it sounds like, too. This is the area by the shed where he was, you know, hanging around for about an hour. This is where he was. So that's how they ended up from, you know, in that area where they recovered the body because the mother and the daughter pointed out to where Chandler had been spending that hour. And th- there were a lot of interesting things that were going on. I, I want to play a clip because this, this interview to me is fascinating. Before Chandler was taken into custody, while you know the police are alerting everyone to this missing couple, he did an interview with reporter Adam Duxter of News 3 Now. This is a great interview that this reporter did. It's an audio-only interview. Uh, because Chandler didn't want to have his face shown. And um, I hope we can link to it because I I think everyone would love to hear the entire interview. We can only play a clip of it. But what's interesting thing, what's interesting here is not only his Chandler's voice, but his explanation of things. So here is Chandler in his own words, explaining why his parents went to White Lake. My last uh, message I got from them, they were going to White Lake for the 4th of July. There's some festivities that go around there, you know, better drink prices at bars, stuff like that for, um, yeah, White Lake, Wisconsin. I think when you start saying things like, yeah, my parents went there because of the better drink prices at the bars, when your parents are missing, this is what you mention, this is what you talk about, that doesn't make any sense. You should be panicked if your parents are missing not talking about the you know the price of drinks the other things he's he made like the reporter was very good about asking specific questions it's like so wait a minute when did you hear from them or or have you called them and then Chandler went down this rabbit hole of well I don't think they had a cell signal here but at the other place they did and this is the cellular service that they use but I hear that someone else I mean he just was going off he was just he was drowning, drowning in the lies, 
Drowning in the Lies. It's a great interview. I highly recommend everybody listen to the whole thing because it's just so revealing. So they went to the area where they saw Chandler, you know, driving the car, backing it up. And they, the police say that they found Chandler's father's remains. He's been identified as 50-year-old Bart Halderson. And according to police, he was shot to death and dismembered. So... Now the question is, where's the mother? And is she alive? Right. I think that's the big question, right? Where is mom? Nobody yeah. seems to know where is mom. And it, it, it's surprising that her, if, if she was also murdered, that her body wasn't recovered in the same vicinity as her husband. So mm -hmm. that's really, I think that's the, the big mystery. Where is mom? Yeah. Now the... Um, prosecutors and investigators in their news conference said something very interesting, which I didn't know how to read. Basically, they said, well, until we have evidence to the contrary, you know, we're still searching for her and hoping that she's alive. Right. So because uh, nobody knows. No, nobody, nobody knows. That's true. I mean, yeah, why? Nobody knows. And so they, I mean, I think that's just the party line. You know, we, we're hoping to find her and we're hoping to find her alive. Um, because they don't know. I don't know if there's any evidence in the home that, um, you know, with her DNA left behind, we, I, we don't know. The, you know. The media hasn't shared that with us. No. And as for the condition of the father's remains, um, apparently, remember, he was chopped up. So the torso, his torso was wrapped in pants and had a belt and a rope around it, according to the state journal. And then a water tank nearby, detectives found scissors, a saw blade, maybe some bolt cutters as well. Chandler was then taken into custody and charged initially with providing false information and because of filing the missing persons case, which apparently was not a missing persons case. And then on July 15th, after officers had a chance to do more investigating, Chandler was charged with first degree murder, hiding a corpse and mutilating a corpse. He's being held on $1 million bond. And of course, his mother, Krista, is still missing. And you know, there, there were just so many pieces of this whole case that just weren't making sense. Like Chandler apparently went to one of the neighbors across the street to ask if their video doorbell captures his house, he wanted to know what the scope of their video camera was. It's a weird thing to say, right? Well, it is. We also have to understand this is a 23 year old. This is not, you know, this isn't somebody who's, you know, a seasoned, you know, criminal or whatever. Um, this is just a kid. This is at 23. He's really a kid. And one of the things, you know, that, that we, we do know about, um, kids who kill, you know, that they're, they're typically male, they're typically white. Um, parasite is a very rare crime in the United States. It is, I think it's less than 2% of all homicides are parasites. And a double parasite is even, you know, slimmer. So is there such a word, but more slim. Um, mm -hmm. We don't see that many cases of double parasite. And again, we don't have a double parasite yet because mom is still missing. We don't know. Um, but he really fits the characteristics of a of an offender who commits parasite. And again, he's not guilty yet. There's been no trial. This is such a rare crime. It is so rare. Um, but he does meet the characteristics, like to a T, of somebody who would commit this crime. I mean, we do know that boys um, who kill their their father will use a firearm. Um, they're angry, and we know mutilation often comes out of anger or to, um, you know, to move the body easier. You know, they're, they're just, just looking at his pictures, he's not a big kid. He looks like he's a pretty small kid, and dad was much bigger. So you wonder how that all even happened. Um, I know the picture of the parents, there's this lovely picture of the two of them. I mean, they look like the nicest people ever, right? They just look... And no one deserves to be treated this way, but it, it's just, you know, sometimes you just get an energy of a person, right? right. So, but we don't know what was going on in the household, so I, I, I can't say anything. I have no idea what was going on here. Um, but clearly, clearly, this young man has told 
a lot of lies. Whether or not he committed this murder will be determined by a jury or a judge, but clearly a lot of the things he said absolutely didn't happen did not happen. There was no couple that came to pick him up because that was the other thing. The reporter who was doing the audio only interview said, well, did you see your parents leave? Oh no, I get up at six in the morning to feed the dogs. I had to feed the dogs at a certain time and they had left already. Like he had, a, he had his like routine answer for everything. Nothing made sense. You know, nothing made sense in this case. So the kids who kill, you know, typically, you know, they have no criminal history. So they're not, you know, they're, they don't know what they're supposed to say because they don't really think these things through. You know, Dr. Heidi has come up with a typology of three types of kids who commit parasite. OK, one is the severely abused child, which I don't think is this young man. Um, the second is a severely mentally ill child. And then the third type of child who commits parasite is the dangerously antisocial child. So when you have somebody at 23 years of age, they typically are not your severely abused child. They're usually younger and, you know, they've been sexually abused or physically abused or emotionally abused and or, and or all of the above. And they just kill to get rid of that, that abuse, right? That's why they kill. Then you have the, the severely mentally ill child. They have some kind of a psychosis, all right, um, that's breeding within them. They suffer from severe depression um, and that can lead to, you know, murdering your parents, you know, whatever, you know, you're, you're angry about within yourself, you can then reflect it on your parent. Then you have the dangerously antisocial kid. And this kind of kid, this murderer is somebody who's killing for a purpose, you know, greed, like the Menendez brothers, right? They killed for money. And so this kid, I don't think, you know, just from what we've been reading and what I'm hearing from you, Anna, it doesn't sound like there was a motive of greed. It doesn't sound like parents were abusing this kid. He really seems like he fits in Dr. Heidi's second category, um, which is the mentally ill. Now, again, it's all speculation, but just from a cursory, you know, view of this of this kid in this case, that's what it would appear to me. Well, I think we're going to find out soon enough because he's in custody. He's not going anywhere. And the district attorney has said that at this point we have, quote, an extremely complex situation. Because remember, the mother's missing. We, we don't know what's going on with the mother. Is she presumed dead? Is she alive? We have no idea. And then um, he, he went on, the district attorney went on to say that the defendant had six days to hide his evidence of this crime and that he lied repeatedly. I'm going to make the argument that while six days is a long time, it's not nearly months or years where other evidence can be destroyed or just not retained as far as shopping for items to help kill, you know, um, surveillance videos, either at convenience stores or from traffic cameras or neighbors. So actually, while six days is a long time to destroy evidence, it's still not that long, in my opinion. It is time for our comment section. These are the crime stories you all are talking about on social media. And here is our very own Owen Michael. What's everyone talking about, Owen? Hi. We Hi. do get comments on our social media and our website, and we read them all, of course. Stop by and weigh in. Uh, this week, we've got a Florida man story. Everybody loves a Florida man story. Police in Daytona Beach saw a man carrying an alligator down A1A one night last week. Police say the man tried to throw the alligator onto a roof of a business, then he slammed it onto the ground. William Bubba Hodge told officers he was, quote, teaching it a lesson. The alligator was returned safely to the mini golf course from where it was stolen. Hodge was arrested. David B. says, looks like the alligator won. Uh, the rest says, yeah, but nobody is talking about what the gator did to him. Old Bubba said he was going to learn today. And Asire N said, I guess the alligator taught him the lesson. L-M-A-O. How did he even grab this alligator? I mean, they're, they're alligators can, you know, they're scary. Yeah, and Bubba, is that for real? Bubba? His, his nickname is Bubba. Uh, the alligator was stolen from my miniature golf course, um, it, it, you know, with apologies to my friends in Florida, there's this has all sorts of Florida uh, elements to it. Um, luckily, the Florida or excuse me, luckily, the alligator is safe. Uh, it was not hurt. And uh, this guy's uh, going to spend a little time, it looks like. 
That is very strange, Owen. Very, very strange. We get plenty of those. <laughs> it's our specialty. Indeed. <laughs> All right, Owen. Thank you. See you next week. See you next week. Bye. That's our program for this week. Dr. Jackson, thank you so much for coming on and giving us your insight. If people want to learn more about you or contact you, where can they find you? Um, they can email me at fjackson at pnw.edu. Thank Excellent. you so much for having me on today. Oh, it's been a pleasure. We love your insight. We really do. Thank, Thank you. you so much for everything. And you can always find me on all social media sites at Anna G News, Anna with one N. You can find our content wherever you get your podcasts, but quite specifically Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. You can actually watch us on YouTube and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or to our newsletter, which Owen puts together. And that's at truecrimedaily.com. Until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. This is True Crime Daily, the podcast. Podcast. And as we always say, don't do crime.